Well, so let me introduce our last pairing. Um, Junkie XL and the legendary Hans Zimmer. How's everybody? Good. Oh, hang on, let's check, check the water situation here. All right, okay. <laughs> Junkie. Yeah. Fancy running into you here. <laughs> if not in Santa Monica, it's I here know. in Hollywood. We never see each other um, <laughs> because our studios are next door to each other, so therefore we never meet. <laughs> well, let me tell you how I did meet Hans for the very first time. <clears throat> Go on, then. Uh, I, I, I decided... Uh, Is this going to be embarrassing? I hope it's embarrassing. Well, I'm, I'm going to leave out the point that I met you in the studio with your Speedos on, but other than that... It, um, no, it was, I decided to move to L.A. Um, in, in 2002, and it was because I saw um, licensed music that was used in a film, and I was so intrigued by how the music worked with picture, and um, I wanted to get into film scoring. That was, that was my goal, and I decided to take the back seat in the bus and, uh, and just learn it from the ground up. So I moved to LA and um, I worked a little bit with Harry Gregson Williams, who was he's a good friend of Hans and also worked with Hans a lot in the, in the past. I would almost say Hans trained uh, Harry to to well, uh, to what he is. H Harry is, you know, the thing is about electronic music. I mean, Harry loves electronic music and is really into it. And he had never touched a computer until he started working with me. <laughs> so you know, another perfectly good Royal College of Music child ruined. <laughs> So I, I, I came to LA, I, I worked a little bit with Harry, and then um, um, eventually I wanted to meet the, the person that was responsible for a lot of iconic scores uh, that I've been a, a deeply a fan of. And uh, I was surprised that it was actually fairly easy to uh, meet a, a quick meeting with, with, with Hans. And in oh, I thought you were talking about John Williams. <laughs> I met him oh, too. Oh. <laughs> no. um, so I, I met Hans for uh, the first time in, 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 I think it was early 2005. And, um, and I remember walking into your room with, you know, it, it, it's like half the size of this room and, it, and it's filled with modular it's, bi it's bigger than half the size. <laughs> and it was filled with modular synths. And then at the same time, I was um, amazed by the, the, the candor and, and friendliness that, you know, Hans wanted to talk to somebody new. And um, I remember we met each other one or two times in that year, roughly, and then at the second conversation I think you, we had, you said, well, maybe you should come over and, 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 uh, and work with me from here. And uh, now looking back, uh, I turned it down. And uh, now looking back, I know that I was so not ready uh, to make that commitment to, uh, to film scoring. And we met every now and then, and we talked every now and then. And then I think something uniquely happened when you called me in at the very end of Inception, when you needed right. a, 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 like a, a remix version of, right. the, of the score. No, I, yeah, I just, I just thought it'd be cool. It just be, I, thought, I thought Inception lent itself to the junky, deconstructive method of music making. Um, so I just gave him my tracks and I said, you know, do whatever you want with it. And um, that's great. Um, no, because I always wanted to work with him. And it's not just that, it's, it's, um, it, sometimes it's very hard to explain to your wife the geekness of it all. And so I try to surround myself with people that I can talk oscillators and filters and <laughs> stuff like that with. And I can do that all day and all night. And I've done this for 30 odd years and I'm still not bored. So that's, you know, um, and, and, and really honestly, I mean, uh, Junkie's music making goes way beyond so many things. I mean, I can't remember what project was on, you know, I was, I was trying to play some riff on a guitar and, you know, I'm sitting in front of him, I'm playing it really badly. He goes, um, do you mind if I just borrow this? And he takes it and just plays my riff with, like, huge conviction and, you know, oh, sounds really good. So it's, it's this sort of, it's talking about the complete musician here. Um, uh, the, then then you, you wrote this basically in opera, you know, for... Uh, 
for the Concertgebouw Orchestra in Amsterdam. Um, so it's, I, I love hanging out with people who are constantly searching and constantly trying to figure out new things. And this man is absolutely doing this. And I, plus, I think it's a very interesting time in film music at the moment, where film music is opening up in, in a huge way. And I mean, really, you guys had Giorgio here earlier on. And um, I remember the first time I saw Midnight Express, it was just like, it truly was electrifying. I went, okay, hang on a second. There is, there is a, there's another voice beyond just the simple symphony orchestra. And now, of course, what, what we've been doing is we've been Trojan horsing electronics into the symphony orchestra because, quite honestly, it's, it's just another instrument. And so, and the way technology has evolved you know, and we are, we are pushing the orchestras to start evolving with us and, and figuring out new ways of recording and new ways of doing these things. And this man is very much part of it. I mean, you know, I can throw anything at him. I can throw 12 dramas at him <laughs> or this, this thing we just finished. Um, I, I wanted to do a score as a band. And so the band is basically... Johnny Ma, Pharrell Williams, Junkie, myself, uh, Mike Einziger from Incubus. And first of all, there were far too many guitars, so Junkie in instantly decided that he should play the bass. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm soloing these bass tracks, which are just tremendous. It's like some wild animal has been let go, but seems to know exactly what to do. You know, so, um, but I think that also makes you... Uh, very unique what I've seen in, in town, you know, when it comes to uh, film scoring. Um, um, and I've experienced that too, to a certain extent in, in Europe, where film composers are really protective, you know, on um, what, they, what they do. And I think you have a, a tendency, and, and in, in your example, I try to do that with my people that work with me too, but also the collaborations that I have. You're very, you're very much about sharing you know, well, knowledge and have people... Learn, I'm not about sharing that. knowledge. I'm about taking the ideas that, yeah. that, you know, like wherever it comes from. I mean, it's just a conversation. It's just a, you know, I come from a band mentality. And um, so the first thing I do is I make the director be part of the band. You know, and I mean, I'm, like on this last thing, I mean, that really was it. You know, we had the director in there with us. Um, he happens to play bassoon, which might not come in all that. <laughs> but um, but but the, uh, one of the problems of electronic music is we get very isolated very quickly because mm. we can just sit in front of our screens or our modular systems or whatever whatever it is you do, and it can just be just you and the machine. And what I think is really important is to have, bring other people in. Um, I mean, there, there was one, one night when um, Skrillex came over. I don't know if you were there or you were no, not I wasn't, there. I wasn't there. Like, like, you know, two o'clock in the morning, Skrillex pops over and we're talking for about five minutes and then we can't actually articulate what, uh, what we're talking about. So he just opens his laptop and just starts making sounds and I start making sounds. And, but our our computers aren't synced up, so we're just sort of jamming, you know, by hitting spacebar, one, two, three, four, spacebar. And, you know, and that, those sort of conversations are really, you know, so suddenly you, you turn that sort of singular, I'm just in my room, um, you know, with my, beside my own bad self all day long, um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 into something much more organic and much more vital. And... Well, coming from the electronic scene, one of the things I found was um, was a big issue when you when you make the translation to film scoring is that the scene that I was part of uh, and I still devote a lot of my my heart to, um, I found it was it was suitable in the way I did it for certain moments in the scene. Uh, but the hardest thing with electronic music is how do you create a narrative, you know, over a way longer time period? And also electronic music by nature, you know, is very dry and it's very loud and it hits, it hits your stomach. But sometimes electronic music needs, needs to sit as a 3D blanket, you know, just like around you 
that doesn't get in the way of the storytelling and that actually leads you through a film without speaking to you too much. And electronic music as we know it at this point that you see on many festivals uh, around the US and even Europe, it's, it's very aggressive, it draws your attention immediately and there's no room for a second form of interpretation of what that is. I mean, it's like, boom, it, it just hits you. So when you have movies like The Fast and the Furious where you know, there are 25 needle drops throughout the film, it, it, it's great to have an electronic uh, track in its pure form. But if you go back to one of my favorite electronic scores, and I'm, I'm sure you agree with me, it's the Blade Runner score by, by Vangelis. It's a perfect example how electronic music was used to, to tell the whole story, you know, and, uh, and basically replace the full orchestra. And I think where electronic music is at this point, we kind of have to reinvent, you know, where electronic music is, how does that, you know, become the equivalent of what an orchestra does or what Vangelis did, you know? Well, now, what, what is yeah, no, no, I mean, it's, it's, you know, the thing I'm always looking for is, uh, an immersive quality. In other words, you want to immerse the audience, and you may want to make the you want to invite the audience into what you're doing, as opposed to you want them to lean forward a little bit. Do you mean them to come in? So you want to so you want the music to be about opening doors all the time, and you, in a funny way, you want the audience to become you know your co-creator, your co-conspirator. Your you know you, you want to be able to bounce off their emotions. You know, and so that this isn't just about a dance track. You can take it much further than yeah. that, because um, you can go way beyond the feet to the heart and the head. So, you know, those are the things that I'm interested in. Um, plus, electronic music lends itself to a, brilliantly to a really abstract way of storytelling. And if you think about what a film score is, a film score isn't telling you what the actors are saying or what the images uh, are presenting that you're seeing on the screen. It's telling some sort of subtext. And the more, sometimes the more abstract I can be with my sounds, as opposed to doing the old cliche, it's a love scene and therefore you hear violins. I mean, I remember having a conversation not too long ago with a director. Um, the scene is, a girl is cry walking through the streets crying in the rain because she just split up with her boyfriend. And he's trying to explain the scene to me. And I, I finally went, stop. Do you understand how often I've written this scene in my life? You know, <laughs> the, the whole point is, you know, you guys keep shooting the same scene and it's up to me to figure out a way of presenting it to the audience in a way as if they've never seen this before. And, you know, I mean, how many deaths have I scored? How many kiss, kisses have I scored? And you always try to figure out a new way of doing it. And part of that is you just have to go and expand your palette. And, and the, 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 the most extraordinary new palette we have is electronics. And it's very young and it's very new. You know, there's 600 years of piano making precedence, right? So um, I started working with electronics, with, ele with computers. I mean, I had my first computer that I misappropriated for music long before most of you were born. And the year was previous century, right? One back, uh, probably 1977, 78, or something like that. It was like a cash register, so you had to go and type the notes in. Like middle C was 24, you know, therefore 24, 26, 27, 28, 29, that would get you through the semitones, etc. So it was fairly boring, fairly arduous, tough, but didn't have to teach me a lot about deconstructing music, and it taught me a lot about counterpoint and stuff like that, because I only had eight notes ever available. But I, I, I don't think many, I mean, I know because we talked about this, but I, I don't think many people know that, um, um, for starters, maybe that you grew up in London and you were, you know, you were part of that whole scene, like, Ultravox and, and you know, uh, oh, yeah, you know yeah. all, all this. Well, there was, a, there was another really good conversation you missed the other day. Um, <coughs> I keep missing good conversations. No, um, <laughs> I, I think you were actually working. You were actually the only person doing some work that night. <laughs> <coughs> and Jean-Michel Jarre came by. Mm. And it be, turned into this conversation between Johnny Ma and Jean-Michel Jarre. And after a while, I just shut up because it was really interesting. Um, about the origins of electronic music. 
and the vocabulary of electronic music. And, uh, you know, and Johnny was talking about the Smith. <clears throat> and really it all came back to this very fundamental idea. We Europeans didn't want to sound like the blues. That was American music. We wanted to find our own voice. And the Stones had already done it. I mean, they'd already, you know, kidnapped the blues. And so for us, continental Europeans, the Germans, the Dutch, the French, our vocabulary became electronic music. You had bands like Can, Neu, Kraftwerk, and I think I should just say Kraftwerk again, just because they're the most important influential band we had. Tangerine Dream, um, Karl Schulze. But our harmonic language was different, because we grew up with classical music. So a lot of European electronic music, I mean, if you listen to a Kraftwerk thing, it's so... I, I went to see Okay, I'm a nerd, I'm a complete geek, I went to see every single one of their shows at the Disney Hall, right? Um, so, uh, but, uh, you know, you know, after, after, you, you know, after the, th the third evening, you're just sitting there and you're starting to really analyze the stuff. Um, and you realize, you know, how fundamentally it is really based on, on European classical music. Mm -hmm. And the harmonies, you know, the moody chords, all that stuff, you know, that's that's in electronic music. I mean, that that that's not the blues. That that comes from a more a more classical repertoire. Mm -hmm. And um, Jean Michel was really pointing that out. And then Johnny was saying that when he started with the Smiths, or you know, or bands like Ultravox as well. Um, again, you know, what they were looking, uh, they were looking at the German bands like. Can and Neu, and again Kraftwerk as their influence. And if you think about Johnny's guitar playing, it's very angular. It's very, you know, it's not funky. Mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 this other thing, you know. And at the same time, then the tra then that music traveled, you know, uh, over to America, and you guys did a whole new thing out of it. So it keeps evolving in a really interesting way. Um, I mean, look, we, we worked with A.R. Rahman, which, which, you know, Indian electronic music, I mean, a great Indian electronic musician. I mean, there's, there's, this, there's a whole movement which truly is driving music forward in a way that no other music is, is, is evolving and driving forward and, and innovating. And um, I was just lucky that I was really bad at playing guitar. <laughs> I mean, I was really lucky to uh, because I I started as a as a more traditional musician as a piano a little bit of piano and drums and guitars, but um, I couldn't find uh, not really a job that was paying really well, so I ended up in a music store. And, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, which, good story. Which, which, which which was great. I was like. 15, 16, and it was around the time, um, it was 83, 84, when the first music computers came out that normal people could afford. I mean, you know, people like Trevor Horn, and you, you probably put your eyes on it, like in late 70s, the first Fairlights, they well, were like half a million pounds or something. Yeah, actually, you know? just, you know, if you think about a Trevor Horn track, if you think about the Frankie Goes to Hollywood stuff, or Grace Jones, Slave to the Rhythm, or any stuff like that, it's so tight, it's all done to yeah. a click. I remember saying to Trevor, Trevor, I think we need to record this to click. And he goes, why would we do that? Where's the feel? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> the click is the only thing you can rely on. So, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if I made one contribution to Trevor's life, I made him a, not a slave to the rhythm, but a slave to the click. <laughs> well, the click came in my life in 1984 when I started working in that music store. And uh, it, was, it was fantastic. Um, because you know, I had access to half a million dollars of synthesizers without needing to buy them. And uh, I made quickly a deal with, with the owner of the store that I could stay light, late nights and at night and I could just like make music with these things. And it was remarkable. And, uh, and, and also, you know, looking now, I think now um, if we talk about plugins and stuff, it, it, it starts to get really exciting again. Almost like two months, three months, there's something new. And then, it was it was insane. It was like the D50 came out of Roland, and then the DX7 2FD came out, and then the Korg M1 came out, and then that came out. And it was like new technology, new technology. And then it seemed like throughout the 2000s, it got a little stale. 
except for the recording equipment, you know, just like Cubase develop like No Tomorrow and Pro I Tools never and owned a DX7, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I agree the manual sucks. But I mean... Um, well, no, actually, funny you should say this about the music store, because that was really my thing as well. I mean, I didn't have any money, but... I had friends in, in a music store, and I had, there were two uh, stores in London, one was Argent's Music, and I could borrow whatever I wanted to borrow, and um, one of the people who worked there at the time was Mel Wesson, who is very involved with, with my scores as a what, ambient music design is the credit we keep giving him, because we don't really know what to call it. <laughs> but I mean, his stuff, you know, he does these amazing textures. And I mean, I've known Mel since I was 18, so that was like a long time ago when he, when he was working in the music shop. And the other people, uh, one of my best friends to this day is a chap called Stephen Payne, who was, was really a musician, but he discovered this thing in Australia called a Fairlight before anybody else knew about the Fairlight. And he went to his cousin who happens to be Peter Gabriel, and said, Peter, I found this thing. Maybe we can do something with it. So Peter got one, and Steve decided he was going to open a shop and s sell these things. So he had the Fairlight, he had the Synclavier, he had the um, Lynn, and all sorts of weird, fabulous, like the, there's a French make of little modular synthesizers called RSF, and they sounded fantastic, and like Steve would have them. And Steve, Steve, look, Steve knew I had no money. I mean, most of the time, most evenings were spent with me phoning Steve and going, you feeling hungry? Where are you taking me for dinner? Because I couldn't afford to pay for dinner. <laughs> and he would lend me his Fairlight. Um, and so, the, the, like, the Fairlight was very important for me. You know, it, that was, you know, uh, a, a huge stepping stone for me. And at the same time, I, I, I kept collecting... Nobody wanted them anymore. I kept collecting old modular synthesizers. I mean, people literally gave me Moog 15s and Moog 55s. I mean, I have a huge Roland 100M system. I mean, it's, it's, it's embarrassing how big it is. And it came from me phoning up Roland and going, hey, do you have any of those modules left? And they're going, yeah, we got a whole warehouse full and it's completely clogging up our warehouse. Do you want them? I'm going, yeah, what do you want for it? And they go, well, I tell you what, we'll do your deal. We'll sell it by the, by the pound. How about $25 a kilo? So, I mean, it's, you know, those were, were there, so, there were some people who could not see the future of electronic music, and then there were some that could. I heard a great and story. And I was lucky. <laughs> I heard a great story um, um, uh, this morning about um, the keeper player from uh, Duran Duran, who uh -huh. literally bought everything he could get his hands on, and they did for right. 10 years, 15 years in a row. They used it on one song and put it into storage. And then, uh, like, only five, six years ago, the keeper player was like, I should look at that storage because there's, like, gold in there. Right. And then he went to, ma to his ma uh, management and was like, so where's the key of that storage? He was like, what storage? And then they looked into it, and apparently, you know, the storage company uh, sent checks for the for the payments, but it went to a wrong address because the management moved to a different address. It didn't have the address. Long story short, they packed everything out and sold it, so it was all all the equipment was gone. So it was like it, and it that stuff is valuable. And I think one of the one of the uh, cool things that you I that you check the bills in my store. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but one of the cool things you've done, and I. I, I I, in a similar way I did is that every box that I bought in my life, I've not sold. I yeah. kept it. When it. Like the stupidest little guitar pedal to... Um, and I think you were mentioning the bass. Like one of the guitar pedals that I use that really makes that sound is like a really old bus bass limiter that basically comes from 1984 or something. Nobody has it. Nobody gives a shit. But for whatever reason, that box is just gold. Right. And um, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pity to, to throw stuff away because there's always a moment where you really want to be using it. And, uh, and you have them, you know. And also what's remarkable about the systems that you have, they're so well kept into, into, into shape. Uh, well, yeah, because, you know, I have, I have real <laughs> deadlines. And I remember on, 
I remember on DaVinci Code, I'd set up this really nice patch on, on, the, on the modular and it was okay for three days and then it just, you know, the oscillators just died. So I just moved to the next set of oscillators. By the time we finished the movie, it, it's, you know, it's like I, I realized this stuff really needs a lot of maintenance. And it's, <laughs> it's a bit of a liability. But then um, it, it, well, I remember it all paid off because at the premiere, I, I remember at the premiere in, at the Cannes Film Festival, once, once the real Moog came in, it just shook the speakers to pieces during the premiere. It was great. <laughs> but what, 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 I, I remember um, uh, during the, the Dark Knight Rises, you build up this massive Moog system, like right yeah. behind you. So it was like, I mean, it was like 30 feet. And normally your room has this gracious layout to do great meetings with directors and people from the studio. But this thing was like halfway in the middle. So there was no room to take no. meetings and everybody was sitting on really comfortable chairs and just like cramped like this because that wall of sin was just there. Well, yeah, no, it's, it's a laboratory. My room's a laboratory. And, and I, I remember Ron Howard once saying to me, you know, we, we were sort of on course for something that was going really well. I can't remember what movie it was. And just as he's leaving, you know, I'm going, oh, yeah, so we know what we're doing. And he just said, sort of in passing, just remember, Hans, not to shut the laboratory doors too early. And I think that's a really great thing that we can do in electronic music. We don't have to say, you know, we don't have to stop experimenting. You know, I mean, I've, 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 I've written scores on dub stages. Um, I mean, like the craziest deadline and writing and still experimenting was Black Hawk Down, where we finished the dub at 5.30 in the evening for the 7.30 premiere. Um, and then after the premiere, we went back to the studio and changed a few things. <laughs> <laughs> so it's you know you know it's a blessing and a curse. But I mean the uh, you know the, look the reason I get up in the morning is just because I love playing with the stuff and having ideas. I mean it's it's you know I, I had this epiphany recently which. It's not much of an epiphany, and it probably will sound really pretentious. Um, uh, the conductor Claudio Bardo died, and I was looking at a video of him on YouTube conducting this orchestra. And you see, during that performance, he's going through every emotion. He's going through a roller coaster of emotion, and it's that, and it's the, the communication he has with the with the players in the orchestra, and it's the communication they have with the audience. And he's on stage and he's doing this thing and it gets to the end of the piece and he just does this because he knows this was sort of a transcendent performance and the audience is silent because they just saw, realized they saw a miracle. Um, and then I was thinking, wow, what a life well lived because as a musician, you, you have a chance to do that every day. Or you can go out on the stage, or you can just, with your friends, you can go and do this. You can do the roller coaster of emotions. And I want to know, other than when it's tax day, which accountant can do that on every day. I mean, even painters, even other artists, are sort of, you know, locked in, into their own little worlds. And, and, you know, what you were saying earlier about, I, I'm opening my room up, you know, come on in. Let's go and jam. Let's go and make a piece of music together. Um, it's because I, I love that thing of all those, um, you know, the, the bouncing emotions of different people and including them. And that's, that, that's what makes, I, I think, you know, that's the best life you can have as being a musician. Yeah, and, I, and I, 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 I totally agree, and I would like to add to that, that when I gradually got more into film scoring, that I felt more liberated musically than I ever was because I, I didn't need to worry about the kick on the one anymore or any sort of rhythm. And, uh, and especially um, in early 2000s to 2005s, I would love to have breakdowns that were up to three minutes, but that was stretching it, you know, just like, uh, and then, you know, the payoff needed to be massive to get, to get back into it. But to play like a, an ambient piece of music you know, that is like 15 minutes long in, on Coachella is not really going to down, go down well, all that well. And, and uh, because it needs to have that pulse, unless it's going somewhere, you know. Um, and, and especially on the darker side of stuff, the, the, uh, the, um, 
the amount of dark sound design and music that you can make for a movie that goes on for a really long time, I, I could possibly never release that as a Junk XL record because it would really freak people out. But well, plus, you know, look, the other thing, one of the reasons I got into movies was because it gave me more freedom. And the other thing is, they had big speakers, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, when, when you watch something like The Dark Knight, etc., in a good theater, you know, an IMAX theater, I, I, I remember we, we were testing the prologue, and we hadn't, you know, we were testing it because we were trying to figure out our soundscape. And this very quiet, minimal bass note I had put in, it was really quiet. And it started up, and I thought I was just going to be sick. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, so we had to go and adjust that a little bit. But, uh, but the possibilities exist. You know? I like a big canvas, you know? and, and IMAX gives me that. And, and it's, film is still a place where people actively are spending money to evolve technology, to, to evolve forward, to... to, to to, they, they know the only thing that can save that industry is just to create a more immersive experience, you know, because waiting for a good script is, you know, everybody, everybody wants to write a good, nobody wants to make a bad movie, but, you know, to find the, the extraordinary script, the extraordinary, where everything comes together, that, that's a bit of a crapshoot, so the, the only thing we can do is, in film, is, you know, we, we try to make the experience better for, for the audience. Um, sonically, you know, and, and, and I think, I, I really, I think, you know, I, I really have to give credit to Giorgio here, because I think he, he was the one who sort of really made people go, wow, you know, music, music is an important component in film. So what, what I'd like to ask you is that if we, if we, we I, I mentioned Blade Runner, which is, you know, now 1981, right. it, it's, and then even before that, you know, yeah. forms of electronic music were used, you know, the first um, Tron, for instance. Right. Um, you know, you've been here for so many years. How do you feel the perception of electronic music in whatever form, whether it's more an art form or, you know, electronic dance music as it right now, how has that perception of that evolved in 30 years of film scoring? And then a second question to that, the, um, the films that I've worked on, small or big, um, there's always that prejudice that electronic music cannot be emotional and that's where the, you know, the orchestra needs to come in. Uh, it, it's all great for the action stuff, it's all great for anything else, but when it comes to emotion, it needs to, you know, no, you got to do strengths here. So well, what, what's well, your take on the, those two things? Well, look, one of the most emotional scores, I'm just going to go sideways slightly, um, is Chariots of Fire. Yeah. You know, I mean, it works. And I, I, I know Van Gellis, and he was living in London at that time, and I used to hang out with him, and I saw Chariots of Fire before the music was on. And trust me, you couldn't give that movie away. And, um, I mean, seriously. I mean, they were, they, they were in big trouble. You know, it was, it was a play. And, should I really say this? I was, I, I was sort of there when, you know, he, he was just jamming around and suddenly he had that tune and it was like, oh, that's pretty good. Um, you know, it's nice to be somewhere where the moment of creation occurs. Um, but it's people like Hugh Hudson who directed um, Church of Fire. Um, it's people like Ridley Scott. I mean, Ridley was always interested in the future. In a, you know, I mean, I mean, and, and he loved electronic music. I mean, he loved Tomita, for instance. I mean, Tomita was a big thing for Ridley. And the, the idea of, is electronic music cold or is it hard to... Um, Not to us, to, to no, you know, to people... All, no, you know, that's... You know, look, 99% of the stuff you get told every day is bullshit. Let's just go there. <laughs> but, I mean, look, if you listen to Brian Eno's The, Asc um, the Ascent, is that what it's called? Um, uh, you know, that there's just like the, some... Well, it doesn't matter. If you listen, there's so much electronic music that touches you deeply at your core. Because it's not about, just like there's a lot of electronic music which is complete rubbish. We all know yeah. that. 
Um, to, and you can say the same about orchestral music, and you can say the same about guitars, you know? I mean, there's Jeff Beck, and then there are a lot of other guitarists, you yeah. know? It's, it's like that. So it's about the artist. It's about, can the artist's vision be represented? I mean, look, look, look at a, a Gerhard Richter painting. You know, there's a, there's a Richter painting I sat in front of, and the whole canvas is the color gray. And I can't tell you why. It's an incredibly moving experience. You know, he just brought it down to that. And, but if anybody else had done it, it wouldn't have worked. You know, so it's, it's the artist at the end of the day. And one of the great things about electronic music is this because people forget that we don't just write the tunes or create the beats or the rhythm or whatever or compose the piece of music. We are actually creating the sound that is. So, so we're, we're starting with nothing. We're starting with nothing other than an idea. And there's a, there's a huge big difference between writing something for an orchestra. Um, you know, I have a vision of a piece of music and I hear it in my head and then I put it in front of the orchestra and then all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to actually get a hundred people to um, not interpret, to understand what I meant by each note. An electronic music done mainly by, you know, one person, it's, it's like a singular performance. You really can, like, laser sharp pinpoint your vision and communicate your vision. So how can that be unemotional? Because you get to look right into the, the person doing it. Yeah. You know, it's a direct form of communication. That's my idea, anyway. But I mean, yeah, the, the reason why I, um, I brought this up is this because it, that's what I've heard, you know, just like on numbers of occasions. It's like when things need to be emotional, you know, they want to rather switch to well, something orchestral. Well, the, plus, plus there's that, you know, look, I'm a huge defender of orchestras, and I'm using electronics to sometimes to frame the orchestra, and sometimes the orchestra frames the electronics. Um, I think if we lost the orchestra, it, would, it, it wouldn't just be about losing um, the, the beautiful sound of the orchestra. I think it would be such a shift, such a rift, such a tear in our culture, you know, uh, that we, we, we would lose a huge part of our humanity. Um, so, and, and uh, you know, at, at first there were always these battles, orchestra versus electronics, etc. You know, every piece, uh, uh, every instrument is a piece of technology. It's just of a different time, and, and it, it evolves. So, you know, don't you know? I always get hit on the head for saying this because apparently it's cruel. But I'm, I mean, a violin is just a piece of wood and a couple of dead cats, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's that technology of that period of time, and it sounds perfectly good, you know. And now we're, we are at the, and we're only at the beginning. I mean, you know, what you were saying about, you know, all those plugins out there and all that stuff and all the soft things, there's a democratization that's going on where you can afford to make music on your iPhone, on your, yeah, it, as long as you can afford something that has a CPU of some type in it, yeah. you can go and make electronic music. And then it divides beautifully between those that come up with great ideas and great, I'm not, I'm not talking about melodies or tunes, that's too easy, but you know, just great pieces of music, whatever form they take, that get under your skin and move you. And we, we just did, um, um, on the back of the 300 score uh, for Warner Brothers, um, I did with Warner Brothers a remix uh, contest. And uh, I've done remix contests in the past of Junkie XL tracks, and it was always great and stuff. And I was surprised that within two days, we had like 4,500 plus downloads of all the stamps. Did which you like my track? <laughs> <laughs> Under what name did you submit it? But uh, so uh, people, um, they submitted tracks, and you, in, in the next few days, I have to. Uh, go go through them and, and sort them out, and we got a huge amount of um, uh, submissions. But what's the most interesting part to touch on what you just said is how people made them. And I don't look at the specs when I just listen to the music. And you know, you you hear a track, and it's like, my God, you know, this is like unbelievable. You know, so well put together and produced. And then and you just see like, oh, I did this in Fruity Loops with a bunch of cracked plugins. It was like. 
Well, actually, one of my favorite electronica tracks, and it's not an electronica track, but it's it's the again, it's talking about the method, is Eric Whitaker's virtual YouTube choir. Have any of you guys seen this? It's what what he did was he just took um, you know everybody recorded themselves at home on their iPhone or on their computer or whatever. Um, and he just put it together, and it's a thousand-piece choir, and it's it's just the most glorious yeah. sound you can hear. And of course, then I stole that idea of him for um, Dark Knight Rises, you know, um, because I said to Chris, "Oh yeah, you know what I want to do in this scene? I want to have a hundred thousand people charmed." And he's going, "That's a great idea." <laughs> um, and then you suddenly go, "Well, we're going to find a hundred thousand people. Plus, we are very secretive when we work. We just don't want the story to get out." So. My hundred thousand closest friends weren't gonna cut it, so we just, uh, you know, did yeah. a sort of a competition online, and and it became, it's you know, again, this is the, you know one of the things which I'm always fascinated by, and I know I'm all over the place here, but non sequiturs after another, it's it's just one of the things that electronics has given us is that we can play with space, and I thought. Nobody had ever done that other than Eric, this idea of that everybody records in their own environment and you put all these environments together and, you know, from all over the world. So what sort of a reverb is that? What sort of a space is that? And it becomes really interesting. Yeah. Am I too geeky? <laughs> and I think, you know, also um, uh, based on that, I think what, what is really uh, interesting is that um, because of the plugins and because of you know, everything that's out there, what you can do with um, electronic music, it starts branching out in, uh, into the sound design. And it also starts uh, branching out into the sound design of a film too, you know, where, the, um, where you actually meet with the sound effects guys because they're doing something that kind of overlaps what you're doing and you want to make sure you're in the same Kind of came, came in a bit <laughs> handy for you on Man of Steel, I seem to remember. Oh, yeah, yes, I did. But I mean, it, 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 it was one of those uh, examples where um, we, we saw the film in, in a rough cut and there was um, a, a sound uh, effect um, of the world engine landing on Earth. And we were sitting next to each other and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, that's a song right there. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I took that little bit of sound design and it basically you know, became this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, with one problem, because in the story, this is the problem with movies, they tell a story. So when the world engine got destroyed, we were suddenly... Without the sound. Without the sound. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we had a big hole in our track, what are we going to do, do now? But it, 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 this, see, the, the funny thing is, I, I, I think of, I don't segregate between music and sound design, you know, it's like, you know, sound is sound. It's like you know, some some you know. I, I get excited about all sorts of sounds, so I don't segregate between those different jobs as well. And I love working with with the sound designers on on, on those films. And I and to be really honest, they love coming in and you know being part of the music. Um, I don't know. I just come from this band mentality and somehow manage to smuggle that into electronics. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> Guys, I'm just going to jump in. It's an incredible conversation, but time to uh, open it out to the floor. There's a few few hands up there. Hey, hi, hands and junkie. How are you? Uh, my name is Hayden Walker. I'm a composer from Australia. I saw a fascinating interview with you, uh, Hans. I think on the making of uh, Thin Red Line, where you'd, you'd been working with Terence Malick for months on end, having a wonderful time. Over a year. <laughs> but uh, also a heartbreaking and almost, I think you described it as almost had a heart attack time. And I was just yeah. wondering, and I guess this would be for Junkie as well, how often is that the process on the films? Is some just easy? Does it just flow? Or do you find you're hitting your head up against the wall many times to get to that place? Well, Terry didn't ask me to kill myself. Do you know what I mean? It's like... Um, but there's there's a certain there's a certain I don't know there's some devil driving me you know um, I got home at six a.m. this morning director didn't ask me to stay there all night you know um, it, this is my one and only life and I love doing music 
and I'm not I'm not a perfectionist. It's something I learned very early on. Just to, to you know, I, I try to get it as good as I can get it, and you know, and that usually means until I'm too tired to work on it. Um, and then, you know, eventually somebody tears it from your hands because the movie has to come out. But all I'm trying to do is create the possibility that I can have another go. Because all I, you know, I mean, musicians don't retire. You know, I mean, as, 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 you know, the, the whole thing is you're doing an idea and another idea comes up. I mean, with Terry, I record, I record it with the orchestra, six and a half hours worth of music. Um, you know, and again, it was it was really an experiment. It was a very experimental process, and the 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 only the only thing between getting some sleep and not getting any sleep was me, because you know I had an ambition, you know, and an aesthetic expectation of myself, which I just I just wasn't good enough. You know, you have to part part of it is, and I learned this from John Powell a long time ago, but who who knows how to make put things into very simple words you know we're talking about that whole thing about the blank page and you're trying to come up with an idea and you're trying to come up with a tone and a style he goes yeah it takes a while you just have to get the movie under your fingers and it's exactly that once you figure out where you want to go when you where you want to go with it suddenly you become that person you in, you know you inhabit that world um and yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I remember coming home and sort of clutching my chest and going, I don't think I'm going to see Christmas. Um, and there's a history of film composers, Bernard Herrmann, um, I can't remember all of them, dying literally on their last cue. But, you know, fuck it, it's rock and roll. <laughs> There's not really anything to add to this, uh, um, ex except something. Hang on, I, I cover death. You can, you can cover sex. No, sex I, and I'll, death, the yeah, two. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but some things to add is that it's like, yeah, some movie uh, movies take a shorter period of time to finish, or and some way longer. But I would almost say that's beyond your control. Um, yeah, you, you know, so three hundred. You know, I only had five weeks to do it, and I had to deliver within five weeks. And with Mad Max uh, Fury Road for Warner Brothers, I started August last year. It's not going to get finished until late July, August this year. So it's like... A, if you're lucky. If I'm lucky. Well, <laughs> so I won't be making Christmas too then this year. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a long process. And then even if it's, a, you know, when it was five weeks, I would sleep six hours a night, five hours a night at best. And even if I work for a year on Mad Max, I would sleep five hours at night at best. Because, you know, you push yourself to the max and try to make it better. You want to push yourself through the limit. I mean, that's really always my goal. And that's what eventually, you know, you know, is well, going to be my last cue too, you know. And, I, and like Hans said, it, it's one of the reasons why I also switched to uh, film scoring A, I really love the medium. I love the the teamwork. I love the the int I mean, the people that you deal with, the intellect that they have, and 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 how they put things together. I mean, George Miller would listen to an hour worth of music once, and then out of the top of his head, we have a six-hour meeting after that, and he recalls every detail, every sound, and how many times it appears, and why it happens here, why it happens there, and. Um, and I've been on a few meetings with Hans and with Chris Nolan, and Chris Nolan is like that too. That you know, that insane sense for detail and why it needs to go at certain spots. Chris can tell after a month if something has shifted by one dB, um, and he has. But if if there's such a thing as a photographic memory, I suppose Chris has a phonographic memory. Um, which which comes in really handy because I'm just like you know doing one idea after the other and then sometimes he'll come to me and go you know um, ideas version eight point four on bar seventy five there's this really cool thing don't forget about that you know and you go, oh yeah so so that's part of it you you're, you're dealing with people who are literate because they they write and they um, read books. 
you're dealing with people who are stimulated by visuals because that's what film is. So they've seen a painting or two in their life and know a little bit about photography. So the, the conversation you're having comes from a different point of view into electronica or into the music or whatever. Um, where it's not quite the way it was when you joined your first band, where the conversation really was, why did the drummer not get laid? Well, <laughs> or, or what's, what's the newest plug-in you're going to buy? The uh. so, so the conversation itself challenges you all the time. And while you're having this conversation about sex and death, um, you're trying to figure out how to translate that into your language. Um, and you know, here, here you have two foreigners mumbling away in English, or what we pretend to be English, when really our language is music, and we could communicate a lot better if we had a couple of laptops right here and turn the speakers up. <laughs> we, you know, you'd know what we mean then. But it, what, what's for, re, for me really interesting uh, too, and you've said this a couple of times, Hans, is that throughout the years working more and more in film, you know, you get specialized in dramatology, you know, with music as your ultimate tool. You know, you start telling more and more stories through, through music. And, um, um, and, and that's the thing that's really challenging me. Plus, on top of that, I got, hadn't gotten to yet, that yet. It's something you really can do until you die. And I didn't, I didn't really see myself, you know, how I used to jumping off the decks, you know, whatever, um, until I'm 95. You know, it, 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 it wouldn't really work. 96. Uh, 96. Mm -hmm. But, you know, film scoring is something. But, yeah, the only thing is, is but you deal with that too, is, is the, um, the stress that comes with it and the, and the, and the, and the pressure. And, uh, I'll, you know, I'll be honest. I mean, the, the, the moments of joy, the moments of peak, um, I've never felt them so strong on both sides in, in film scoring. So when something worked out or when a director was you know, giving you a pat on the shoulders, like, man, you fucking nailed that scene home. It was fantastic. Um, but then the lows, when you can't, you know, when you're on that night and you can't deliver and you need to present that cue in the morning, they're, you know, they're, they're low, I'll, I'll be honest. And I never felt that lowness when I was Junkie XL, the electronic music artist. Um, so it has all these sides, but it, 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 uh, it really attracts me and it, it shapes my being, you know, into something that I uh, like to become. So I, it, it really attracts me. Well, the, the, the one thing I always remember, remind myself of, yeah, this is supposed to ask questions, we're just yammering away. <laughs> um, the, the, what, what, one, one thing that the director is cheering you on, you know, he's on your side, and the producer, and everybody is. Because um, if, you, if you do a good job, that movie's going to be better. And the other thing which I think is very interesting about the whole mechanism of the whole idea of film studios and filmmaking is that they understand that to progress, to advance, we have to fail occasionally. We have to go out on that, the, you know, the abyss of shittiness and just fall right into it occasionally. And, and they'll applaud you for it, and they will help you for it. If you, if you come up with a crazy idea, they're, they're actually going to listen. And I find in, 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 in most other walks of life, in most other jobs, I mean, you know, when you, when, you, when you come up with a crazy idea, everybody tells you, no, you can't do it. Or, or it's, I mean, look, Started at school, you know, when I was a kid, I mean, I would have these ideas and everybody was just forever shutting you down, you know, because they're not prepared to, they don't understand to create something that moves people, that, um, you know, you have to take, take risks and to take risks you have to have people that support you in this and um, cheer you on. But at the same time, I'm a junkie here. It never gets any better. I've done, I don't know what, over 100 movies. That first time when I play a theme or an idea to somebody, I'm a wreck because it's the only time I truly expose who I am, you know, my inner self. It's the only time anybody, the only time you can really look inside me and really know who I am is through my music, not through my words. I can hide behind words. I can hide behind this rather chic jacket. Um, so that's not me, but the music is me. 
And when somebody doesn't like that, and music is indefensible, it either resonates with you or it doesn't. And if it doesn't resonate, man, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. right. okay. uh, great way to end the afternoon. Thank you very much. I think we have to put it there. Right. Hans Zimmer, Chunky XL.